Thanks very much, uh, Phil and Natasha and Jim, for giving me this opportunity. I'm as worried about global warming as the rest of you, but I'm even more worried about something else humans can do to the planet, to our climate, and that's using nuclear weapons in a nuclear war. That's what I want to tell you about. So Brian Toon and I have been trying to get the message out of our recent work for the past several years, and we don't think we've been very successful at reaching people that need to know in the policy community. So I'm here to ask you for some help. What can I do differently? I'll tell you what I did, I'll tell you what I'm doing, and I'd really like some feedback. Uh, Carl Sagan and Steve Schneider were very successful in communicating nuclear winter research when it first came out in the 1980s, and then the arms race ended, and most people think the problem's gone away, but it hasn't. We still need to communicate that, and that's what's been frustrating us. So here's what we've done so far. We've published journal articles, which scientists read, in, in PNAS, JGR, ACP, climatic change, on climate model results, on the impacts on agriculture. We were rejected uh, a, a, as far as the medical impacts in a couple medical journals. We've also tried to write popular articles to make it accessible to non-scientists. We had an article in Scientific American and in Physics Today, and I've written a couple encyclopedia articles. And then we tried to actually get articles in the policy journals. Now, Science and Nature both published uh, articles about policy, but it turns out policymakers don't read Science and Nature, so that had a <laughs> little effect. Uh, we had one article in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist, which some people write, read, but we were rejected at Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy, the main journals. We, it's not important, even though they published nuclear winter papers in the 1980s. And the new AAAS journal, Science and Diplomacy. We went to Washington and briefed Congress, sponsored by AAAS in 2008. No, no success. And two thousand, just a, a month ago, I was talking to my Senator Menendez, who's now the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We'll see what comes of that. We talked to uh, John Holdren, the President's Science Advisor, and he said, "Oh yeah, I'm part of Pugwash. I I'm with you, but we're not interested in doing anything about this." Uh, I wrote a letter to Obama. No response. Uh, two years ago, at the AAAS meeting, I organized a session on to honor Steve Schneider, and Ralph Cicerone was there, the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and we said, Ralph, we're, could you do a National Academy study on this? It was very important in the 1980s that it looked at all the work. Yes, I agree, it's really important. I'm gonna do a study, and, but it, nothing, nothing ever happened from that. Uh, I, I talked to Andy Revkin at the New York Times when our new work came out, he wrote an article about this, and a couple times he promised me he would write an article and nothing happened. The last was he offered to do a Google Hangout, which still hasn't happened. We tried to submit op-eds to the major newspapers. All of them were rejected. Uh, I've given conference presentations at science conferences and public lectures whenever anybody says, do you want to give, come give a talk? Yeah, this is what I want to talk about. I made up a web page with all our results and some images. On YouTube, four and a half years ago, I put one of the movies of my results. It's gotten 19,000 hits, which I don't think is very many. Uh, Linda Williams told me you should do Twitter, so I started that a couple months ago. I have 191 followers now. Also, is not very many. And she fixed up, so my, I started a Facebook page, and my tweets go to my Facebook page, but I don't know how useful that is. So uh, I don't know what to do. How do you get people's attention? Uh, uh, we've asked Al Gore. To, he wasn't interested, Jim Hansen isn't interested, the people that really do get attention talking about climate science. Maybe I'll try Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's gonna do, do, start Cosmos again next year. I'd like to do a TED Talk, uh, but I haven't been invited. But there is TEDx, which is a, a local versions of TED, and I'm gonna get, do a TEDx talk uh, later this month. So what I'd like to do for you now is a practice run of my TEDx talk. So pretend you don't know anything about climate, and I'd like to get some feedback from you. How effective is this? What can, is this a good thing to do? Am I wasting my time? What, 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 how should I do it? So uh, here goes. Here's our beautiful planet, but after a nuclear war, it might look like this, with a black cloud of smoke covering the planet, uh, blocking out the sunlight, making it cold and dark at the Earth's surface, killing all the crops and producing famine. This is what we call a nuclear winter, and we discovered that this could happen in the 1980s. This nuclear winter would, would uh, prevent agriculture around the world, and 
after your food was used up, there would be no more food. Now, I'm telling you this because it did change policy back then. Here's a graph of the number of nuclear weapons on the planet. And there were, the arms race ended. Why did it end? It ended because of nuclear winter. The first nuclear winter papers were published uh, by Russians and Americans working together, giving the same answer. And then the next year, Steve Schneider's group, Covey et al., and my paper came out, and then the, then the arms race ended. There was a lot of discussion about nuclear winter at the time. It was quite controversial, and it made people realize what the direct effects of nuclear weapons would be. They're horrible enough, but this would be even more horrible. People without weapons would be affected too. And there was a lot of push to do it, and it ended. Now, there are other arguments of what ended the arms race. One is that the Soviet Union ended, but it didn't end until five years later. But we can do some research. We can actually ask the guy that made the decision. So Mikhail Gorbachev was interviewed in 2000. He said, models made by Russian and American scientists show that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. The knowledge of that was a great stimulus to us, to people of honor and morality to act in that situation. The, it's still a problem, though. People have forgotten that the problem still exists, and so I'm still frustrated that the problem isn't solved yet. It might have looked like it's a very small number at the end of this, but it's still 5,000 weapons on the planet. Now, what happens when a nuclear bomb goes off? It burns the cities that it's targeted in industrial areas, and the smoke goes up in the atmosphere into the stratosphere above where wa rain can wash it out, and it lasts for a long time. And unfortunately, we have examples of cities that have burned. So this is San Francisco in 1906, which burned after the, the earthquake. Jack London was out on the bay, and he wrote an article for the very popular uh, magazine, Collier's. He wrote, within an hour after the earthquake shock, the smoke of San Francisco's burning was a lurid tower visible 100 miles away. And for three days and nights, this lurid tower swayed in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, and filling the land with smoke. I watched the vast conflagration from out on the bay. It was dead calm, not a flicker of wind stirred. Yet from every side, wind was pouring in upon the doomed city. East, west, north, and south, strong winds were blowing in upon the doomed city. The heated air rising made an enormous suck. Thus did the fire of itself build its own colossal chimney through the atmosphere. Day and night, this dead calm continued, yet near the flames, when it was often half a gale, so mighty was the suck. And forest fires also have pumped soot up into the stratosphere. This is what San Francisco looked like afterwards. All the buildings, except for the stone ones, had burned to the ground. This is a, a drawing done by a survivor of Hiroshima. What they remember is the fires and the smoke. And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. John Lomborg, who drew the other diagram, did this in the 1980s of what these plumes of smoke might look like at the beginning. And so uh, there are now nine nuclear countries in the world. And the rate's been going up rather rapidly. So it turns out our new work shows that it's not just the US and Russia we have to worry about. We have to worry about other countries that have many fewer nuclear weapons. Now there's nine, and other countries want them. So here's a table of the number of nuclear weapons in the world. Russia and the U.S. each have about 10,000. These other countries, uh, France, China, Britain, Israel, have a couple hundred. Why didn't they make thousands? How many weapons do you have to put on a, the capital of your enemy to deter them from attacking you? One? Correct. So maybe you need two weapons in case one doesn't work. Why do you need tens of thousands? They aren't just like bigger bombs. We can also learn from why are there 32 more countries that have enough material to make these weapons that have chosen not to. What can we learn from that? It's not a secret how to make them. Now, you'll notice India and Pakistan each have about 100. Imagine along the Kashmiri border, some soldier along the border sees something on the other side and shoots a gun, and the other one shoots back, and there's some miscommunication, and India and Pakistan move into a nuclear war using half of their nuclear arsenal, so 100 bombs. And we said, let's assume it's only Hiroshima-sized bombs, which are very small. Brian Toon and Rich Turco asked me at an AGU meeting uh, a few years ago, what would ha we, we calculated how much smoke would come from this, and we'd like you to work on the climate response. So I ran a climate model, used the GIS, the GIS climate model for that. 
It turns out this would inject about 5 million tons of smoke into the upper troposphere, which would then be lofted up into the stratosphere and blown around the world. And our model showed it would last for a decade, much longer than we thought before, because the soot gets heated and goes up into the atmosphere. So we did this scenario, and here's a movie, and on, you can see where the smoke goes. And on the left is a diagram of the vertical distribution. The black line is the tropopause, so it gets heated way above the, the uh, into the upper, tro uh, upper stratosphere, and it lasts for, for the e-folding time is about, I won't say e-folding time in my TED talk, the, but the e-folding time is about five years, and so uh, it lasts for a long time, uh, much longer than, than volcanic uh, smoke, and volcanic aerosols, and so it covers the whole world. And so it turns out this is a danger to us on the other side of the world. We then took the data, we looked at, the, uh, at how much the temperature would go down, how much the precipitation would go down, how much the sunlight would go down, and calculated with crop models how it would affect agriculture. Uh, this is a, the global average temperature. I put, it, I put the, the red curve on the curve we know and love about global warming. First thing to say, this is not a solution to global warming. Uh, th that idea is called geoengineering, which is probably also not a good idea. Phil's going to talk about that later. There are risks as well as benefits associated with that. This would produce, and, that, and geoengineering wouldn't kill uh, uh, 20 billion people like this scenario would. Uh, this would produce global climate change unprecedented in recorded human history. It would bring temperatures down below the Little Ice Age temperatures. And, I don't know if you looked at Richard's uh, curves. He was looking at the hot end of the curve, but there's a cold end of the curve too. And if you make it too cold, crops aren't happy with that either. So this is a table of our results. For the U.S. corn and soybeans, production would go down by 10 or 20% for a decade. Now there was a, 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 drought, a drought in Russia a couple years ago, and it got hot, and they stopped exporting wheat. You can imagine if there's this threat of, to the food supply, uh, China, rice production will go down by 25% to the same level back when they had several hundred million fewer people. Countries would stop exporting, there would be a food catastrophe, and people now that depend on imported food would really be threatened by that. And our new results, looking at winter wheat in China, China's the biggest producer of wheat in the world, might be a 50% reduction. We haven't published that yet, but that's even really scary. Even the, even the uh, countries, uh, that, that might be even worse. So now there's chronic malnutrition. About a billion people don't get enough food to eat every day. And so maybe two billion people might be dead from starvation from this scenario of a, quote, small nuclear war between countries on the other side of the world that have global implications. Now, Ira Helfand, uh, a physician who's active in this, wrote an article about our results last year and was able to show them to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And Gorbachev said, I'm convinced that nuclear weapons must be abolished. Their use in a military conflict is unthinkable. Using them to achieve political objectives is immoral. Over 25 years ago, President Ronald Reagan and I ended our summit meeting in Geneva with a joint statement that nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, and this new study underscores in stunning and disturbing detail why this is the case. So he saw, and so I consider that a, a small success, but again, he doesn't, control, he doesn't control nuclear weapons, and so he can't do anything about the present problem. But it's much worse than that. It's much worse than that. One U.S. Trident submarine might have 100 nuclear weapons, much bigger than the ones we use in our scenario, equivalent to maybe 1,000 Hiroshima's, not 100. And the U.S. has 14 of them. And that's only half of our arsenal. And Russia has an arsenal just as big as our arsenal. They can produce, a war between the U.S. and Russia today could produce not 5 million tons of smoke, but 150 million tons. So we took our modern climate model, went back and did the nuclear winter scenario from the past. There was always a question, was it nuclear winter, was it nuclear fall? We went back and did that. And now here's a, a movie of where the smoke would go after that. Much thicker smoke covering the world, having much larger temperature uh, impacts. And so I had to rescale the plot now. The red is a curve I showed you before, but for 50 million tons, it would be the green curve, and for 150 million, the brown curve. Temperatures would get be below ice age temperatures, and this would be catastrophe for global agriculture. 
So this bottom of this uh, wonderful painting is how I feel about this, and the top is a volcanic sunset that, he, that, that Edward Monk drew after Krakatau. How do you test this? I'm, what I've been telling you so far is just theory. It's computer models. We don't actually want to do the experiment in the real world, but we can learn from some things that happen in the real world, like volcanic eruptions. So here's the Tambora eruption in 1815, which produced the year without a summer. That summer, Lord Byron in 1816 and his friends, the, uh, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft, were having a vacation in Lake Geneva, and it was cold and gloomy, and they couldn't go boating and hiking, and so they had a contest as to see who could write the scariest ghost story. And Mary Wollstonecraft wrote Frankenstein, inspired by the climatic effects of a volcanic eruption. Byron wrote, didn't write a, a, a book, but he wrote a poem, Darkness, which goes like this. I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander darkly in the, in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. And morn came and went and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread of this their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. It wouldn't really be that bad, this is poetic license, but this is, the, it, this is really what nuclear winter would be like. And I l found out about this poem from a, a Russian colleague when we were working on this in the 1980s. Brian and I were able to get an article in both in Atomic Scientists last year. We called it self-assured destruction. It used to be mutually assured destruction. If country A attacks country B, country B will attack you back and you'll all die. But it turns out it's self-assured destruction. You can't use nuclear weapons. If country A attacks country B and country B does nothing, people in country A will die. It's like committing suicide. So why do we have the weapons? Now, Obama and Medvedev signed the New START Treaty in Prague. And, but it turns out that's going to bring us down to 5,000 weapons in the world, which can still produce nuclear winter. It sets a good example, but we really have to reduce the weapons much faster. How can we expect Iran not to build weapons when we keep ours? It's like sitting in a bar telling people not to drink. Only nuclear disarmament will prevent the possibility of a nuclear catastrophe. And there have been many examples in the past where we almost had a nuclear war. I think we've been really lucky to have survived this long without a second nuclear war. This is a picture I took in Cuba a couple months ago of a Russian rocket that were taken there and uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1963, 62, there, uh, there was uh, almost a nuclear war that began between the U.S. and Russia. And there have been many other examples of this. The only way to stop this from happening is to not have the weapons in the first place. Now, in a very surreal experience, Fidel Castro invited me to come down to Cuba and talk about this a couple years ago. And here's a, a photo of me giving a, an hour-long version of this talk, uh, signed by him. And uh, nine days later, in his blog, he wrote, while the United States and Russia each committed to reducing their nuclear arsenals in Prague, the only way to prevent a global climate catastrophe from taking place would be by eliminating nuclear weapons. So he got it. Now, fortunately, or maybe un unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, he doesn't have nuclear weapons anymore. To, he can't do anything about it. But it's the countries that have them that really have to be influenced. And I see no evidence that they're paying attention. There were, Norway hosted a conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons earlier this year, and 132 nations attended and agreed that we, there should be a ban on nuclear weapons. There's a ban on chemical weapons. There's a ban on biological weapons. But the worst weapons of all, there's no international ban on nuclear weapons. Why is that? They presented our results. That was very useful. There's going to be a, a meeting in Mexico next year to continue this. And at a UN meeting uh, in April, uh, other countries are calling for this. But the problem is, how does it feel? It feels bad. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, it's been a real bummer uh, to telling you about this. The natural reaction is just to forget about this, to pretend it didn't happen, to go drink at the, at the uh, uh, poster session and try and forget about this. But there's really something you could, as Mark Twain said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Uh, people thought that the nuclear winter problem was solved, but it's not. It's a simpler problem to solve than global warming because you only have to get rid of a few thousand weapons. It's not like changing the whole energy structure of the planet. So let's solve this so we have the luxury of worrying about global warming. And if you, and if you want to do something personal, you can join ICANN, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, which is just starting up in the United States. Thanks.